God of wisdom, by your spirit, may your word be proclaimed, that we may know good news in our hearts and minds, and bear witness to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in word and deed. Quiet within us any voice but your own, that we might hear your word to us today. Amen. Amen. You can tell we are hurtling towards the season of Advent, can't you? We're listening to the scriptures. They're all about the resurrection and eternal life and what comes next. Because that's the season of Advent, is the waiting of the return of Christ. And so as we get closer and closer, our scriptures are going to begin to reflect that resurrection theme. We hear that this morning, even in the Old Testament, when the prophet Haggai is going to the leaders of his day, and he says, hey, I know you guys remember the splendor of what our temple used to look like, the first temple, before it was destroyed and it looks the way it does today. I know you remember that. And you probably don't think anything of it because, well, it's, you know, kind of ugly and it is what it is. But I'm telling you, the word of the Lord has come to me and the Lord is ready to do a new thing and to return this temple to its former glory. In other words, the resurrection of the place of worship, the resurrection of God's faithful people coming back together. This was good news, especially for people who had been in captivity for so long. The psalmist speaks of it. Even Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, they were a community under great persecution. And so they obviously had been writing and asking Paul, well, what happens in the resurrection? What are we supposed to be doing in the midst of all of this? And so he's replying to them. You know you have life in Christ. You know this. You believe, you profess your life in Christ, and he is the first of the resurrected. And we, because we believe in Christ, we also are heirs of that promise, and we too will have resurrected life. Now get busy living your life. <laughs> then you get to the gospel. Now, there were some Sadducees. We need to be clear, it was just some, not all, okay? And certainly, um, there were more of the Pharisees and, and the leaders of the temple in the time of Jesus that did teach and believe in resurrection. But there was a faction in the Jewish temple of that first century, in the days of Jesus, who did not believe in resurrection and were not teaching that. And so they have come to trick Jesus. And that's exactly what this whole parable is that they give. You know, there's this wife, and she's married to the first brother, and there's six more in line, and they all die, and they all die childless. Wow, there's definitely some stuff going on there. <laughs> I'm not tackling that part this morning, but it makes you think. The story that they bring is such hyperbole, but the law that they bring was true law. It was true scripture. In the Torah, which they teach is the words given by Moses, there is a law. And it says that if a woman and a man they get married, but the man dies and leaves the, the widow childless, in other words, without a son to care for her, and she can't return home, and he, the man that died, had a brother, then that brother should marry her. It was a way to provide protection and welfare for that widow. That was the law, and that was the purpose, and it was a good law. But the Sadducees, they're not worried about the law. They're worried about this resurrection thing that they don't believe in. And so that's really what they're coming, and they want to get Jesus stuck in a corner. They're trying to trip him up. If we know, when we've been reading the Gospel of Luke, we're paying attention that Jesus is in Jerusalem, and we're in the final days. He knows that. He's just waiting when they will come and arrest him. He knows what's going on. So they're really working hard to trap him. And so they ask him this great hyperbole of a parable. And Jesus goes, um, guys, that's just silly. There is no marriage for those in the resurrected life. Those of us who are here on earth, we get married, we have these relationships, but in the resurrection life, the afterlife, the eternal life, we don't marry and take spouses. 
It's not the same kind of life because you will be like angels as the children of God. Isn't that an amazing promise this morning to hear that? You will have life after what we think of as life. And it will be different what it will be. Jesus says the focus we need to be focused on isn't the afterlife. You and I can't do anything about it. We're not there yet. Praise be to God. Right? I'd like a few more days myself. Right? So we're not there. We can't fix it. There's no need spending a whole bunch of our life now worrying about it. Just accept the promise. That you are a child of God and you will have eternal life. You will be a child of God. You will be like angels. So what does it mean to live our life now? We have to be the children of God today also. We have to fulfill and live into the purpose that God has given us to do. And here at St. Margaret's, we're doing that. If you were with us, and many of you were yesterday for an amazing, wonderful day at our Christmas market, our Christmas fair, had a wonderful time. And now I cannot tell you how much we raised. We haven't counted that yet. But I want you to know something. I'm not worried about that part. To me, the more amazing and more important part of what happened yesterday is the fact that we had our doors open, and I don't know about you, but I made new friends. I met people of our community because that is who we say we are, that we are going to be the center of spirituality, the center for prayer, the spirit, the center where people are willing to walk together on our spiritual life journeys. That's our purpose, our vision, our mission, and that God's calling us to do that, and we did that yesterday. We got to know community. We brought the community in. And to live into that fully, we're just beginning. I know since early 2000s, you all have heard, oh, we're going to build over here. Well, my friends, I know it's hard to see driving 55 plus miles an hour down this interstate highway right here. But there is a wall. It's been there for over a week or more now. It's no longer a dream promise someday. It is becoming reality day by day and very quickly. The people are coming. The people are coming. We really are a church centered. God has so prepared us for this wonderful moment and opportunity to live in fully into the call and the purpose he's giving us. And I'm excited about it. I hope that you are excited about it. Excited to be a part of it. And I know many of you are. Because some of you were vendors yesterday, some of you were um, helpers in so many ways, and not just on Saturday. You were here Thursday setting up, you were here Friday setting up, and all in preparation, and then helping put it back all together, so it looked like church this morning. Um, you've been a part of that, but you've also been a part of all the planning and all the praying and all the preparation that's leading up to fulfilling God's mission for us. It is so exciting to be a part of St. Margaret's right now at this time. So I hope that we each can live into that and be prayerfully thinking about what is my part in the bigger part and getting ready to truly welcome, to walk alongside of others in our spiritual journeys together. Let us pray. Holy God, you have commanded us not to be afraid, to be, and you have assured us of your holy presence. In the midst of our trials and joys, our sorrows and dreams, may we know your presence and rejoice. Grant us courage, O oh God, to take delight in your spirit at all times and in all places. Grant us faith, O oh God, to see the myriad of ways that you give us life. Grant us hope to participate fully in your work in this world. Grant us love to welcome, respond, and act with compassion in all that we say and do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.